Welcome to the Business of Government Hour TV, a video companion to our flagship radio program. I'm Michael Keegan, your host. Each week, government executives and thought leaders join me for an informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. These individuals are truly changing the way government does business. What are the U.S. Army Reserve's strategic priorities? How does it support civilian authorities? And what are the essential components of force readiness? I'll discuss these questions and so much more with Lieutenant General Charles Lucky, Chief of the Army Reserve and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Reserve Command. Also joining us from IBM is Townley Kozad. Take a look and take a listen and enjoy the entire interview on iTunes or at businessofgovernment.org. What are your specific duties and responsibilities as Chief of Army Reserve and Commanding General of the U.S. Army Reserve Command? Different set of responsibilities. I, I don't want to say that they're, it's a technical distinction because it's not. Obviously, it has significant, uh, there's a significant legal nuance between the two sets of responsibilities. But I would say, you know, from, from, from the listener's perspective and, from, and frankly, from my own soldier's perspective, um, it's really... The best way I can explain it is it's the responsibility of the chief of the Army Reserve to make sure that the commanding general of the Army Reserve Command has has the has the resources, has whether it's policy, whether it's money, whether it's um, you know relief from certain requirements. Essentially, the the chief of the Army Reserve is supposed to be the person in Washington who is helping set the commanding general of U.S. Army Reserve Command up for success in terms of building those units from an operational perspective. So the good news is those two guys know each other really well. <laughs> okay. The challenge the challenge is since they're the same person, that would be me. The challenge is for them to remember who they are in any given conversation. Um, so it's it's a it's actually relatively easy for me, um, which may or may not surprise you. It's it's sometimes much more difficult uh, for other for other uh, leaders across the Army to sort of understand what, in what role I'm operating because uh, they see one face. Mm-hmm. I recognize I got two different sort of sets of responsibilities, but they're very much mutually supporting and complementary. Mm-hmm. So I task myself on a daily basis to do things. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it gets done. So regarding those uh, dual responsibilities, if you will, what are some of your top challenges you face and how have you sought to address those challenges? Without a doubt. The, the biggest challenge that I have as a leader of this team is to drive uh, at the, I won't say strategic level because that's a little grandiose, but at a very high level, uh, w- looking over a time horizon, so not, not just today and tomorrow, but out into the future, driving a change in the culture of one of the three components of the Army and, and ensuring that the, that the culture of that component matches and is going to support the development of certain capabilities to deal with the emerging threats in the 21st century. To put it a different way, we have spent the last 15, 16 years, the Army, for all the right reasons, and I've, I've, I think I've said this publicly in many different fora, um, focusing on a certain type of warfare, by and large, in a certain part of the world, and having a relatively predictable sense of when we would need to move the next unit or the next capability into that theater of operations. We are now in an environment where there are competitors, potential competitors um, on, the, on a global scale that have the ability to challenge our military capabilities, our military power, what we have referred to as overmatch, what we have essentially relied on to be able to operate to some degree of impunity across in certain domains, uh, who now have the ability to challenge us in each and every one of those domains. My view of this, to some extent, candidly, is informed by my my previous assignment as the chief of staff of NORAD, U.S. Northern Command, where I spent four years learning about and watching emerging threats in the world. And so when I came to this job, one of the first things that I seized upon and talked to my soldiers about was we have to change the way we look at ourselves in terms of readiness, in terms of capability, and in terms of the environment in which we'll operate, not because you got a new boss, but because the threat has changed over the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. So that's so it's really, to, you know, very simply, driving the requisite cultural change in an organization is probably the biggest challenge I face. 
I would just ask, what has been most gratifying for you uh, since you've taken on the current role? This is a fantastic, fantastic job in, in, in many respects. But of all of them, I will tell you, I think the most consistently rewarding aspect of my responsibilities is, is meeting with, talking to, um, leading Americans, America's youth, American soldiers, who have not only taken on the responsibility to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, but are also doing it in the context of maintaining civilian jobs and you know, raising and taking care of and being very much engaged in their own families, which ostensibly all soldiers do. But they're, and they're doing it, as I said, across this huge expanse of space. So they're everywhere. They're in every town. You know, we were talking recently about this sort of issue about the, the pervasive uh, scope of where our soldiers are. Somebody told me the other day, there isn't, there, isn't a, there isn't a middle school or high school in America that doesn't have at least one child in it that is somehow directly related to somebody who's serving um, in the United States Army. Now, whether that data point is specifically true or not, what I do know is America's Army Reserve accounts for a lot of that scope mm -hmm. across America because we're not enclaved in bases. We are literally everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, it, it has been extraordinarily rewarding and fulfilling for me to feel very much a part of that connection with, with America through, through this team. So, uh, General, um, I'd like to get a sense of your strategic direction for the U.S. Army Reserve. Perhaps you could highlight some of your key priorities for enhancing your foresight and agility to meet the uh, increasing global and complex challenges you face. So let me tell you the sort of the three priorities or bins. Uh, priorities is probably not a fair way to characterize. I would say lanes, lanes of, of activity or line, lanes in the road or lines of effort, or however you want to characterize it. So we've already touched, touched upon one, which is really readiness of the force. Within the, within the context of readiness, uh, we've identified, depending on what may be required in terms of time and where we would have to potentially go and what the Army would need from us and what the joint warfighter would need from the Army. Um, and when I say warfighter, I'm talking about the combatant commands that would potentially need uh, capabilities. The, uh, about 18% about of uh, our force, that, when I say our force, I'm talking the Army Reserve, needs to be ready to go at a sufficiently high level of, of capability and when I talk about capable, I'm talking about ability to move, ability to shoot, which is lethality, uh, the ability to, to survive and win on a modern battlefield. Um, so 18 percent, so plus or minus somewhere between 25, 30,000 soldiers potentially, very quickly. When I say very quickly, I mean less than 90 days. In some cases, significantly less than 90 days. So, so t to get after that, uh, we've basically designed a concept or a construct, and it's Ready Force X. And the reason there's an X there is because it changes depending on the threat and the potential location because some places, some threats require certain capabilities, other threats would be addressed with other capabilities. Um, but that basket of formations is, is fairly well-defined, and it is a driver intellectually and practically for a lot of other activities. So when you talk about modernization, which formations get equipped first, where do we put our priority in terms of how we man it with full-time support to make sure it stays at a high level of readiness, where is the equipment supposed to be, um, how much training do they need in any given year, where do they need to go. To? All, of the all of the questions I just posited, they all sort of get answered within the context of, well, who needs to be ready to do what first? So let's focus there because we know this is what's going to happen on a bad day. So that's the, the driver. From, again, it's an intellectual construct, but, it, but, but I could, I'm not going to, but I can name by unit who actually falls into this basket. And so that's really helping us from a, from a strategy perspective almost, um, certainly from a con conceptual perspective, to get at meeting those requirements quickly. So that's, that's the readiness piece from an operational perspective. Supporting that, by and large, is the next line of effort, which is what I call all things employers and families. Because we're not going to get ready unless our soldiers are ready. So the, so the fundamental building block of readiness is the individual soldier. So from a reserve component perspective, there's 
a couple aspects to that. One is I want to make sure that all of my soldiers understand our expectation is that we are ready enough to be relevant from a Department of Defense perspective, but we're not so ready that they can't keep good civilian jobs. I mean, the, 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 the what we bring, what America's Army Reserve brings to this war fighting enterprise and capability is, is a very, very capable set of units that are needed very quickly, but we can bring it to to the to the fight to the to the environment, whether it's to deter or to actually conduct uh, combat operations or support combat operations. We can do all that at a significant cost savings to the taxpayer. I mean, if I'm if I'm ready enough to be as good as the full time force all the time, then I'm probably the full time force, which is a different financial proposition for the American people. So I try to make sure I'm very clear on what we really bring to this uh, from a strategic perspective. That requires me to engage employers across America and influencers that are capable of helping me influence those employers to make sure the employers of America understand when you share your talent with me, when you're willing to share one of your great employees with the leader of America's Army Reserve, this is a partnership because this is all about us being woven together to, to, as, from a national security perspective to, to support the security fabric of the United States. That's, that's what the American people want and need us to do. So I want to make sure employers understand they're part of this team. And you, you're not, you, you're, you are doing the right thing. I mean, this is a patriotic thing for you to do in many cases to, to support this, the national security apparatus of the United States by sharing really, really good talent with us. And we have fantastic talent in our reserve. And then the third part of this is the family. So I look at it as a triangle sure. because I've got to make sure that the family's comfortable, that the, the soldier is able to maintain good civilian employment, able to spend time with family, doing the things that we expect members of families to do, and at the same time, being ready and able to, to support the war fighting effort in the United States. So that's number two. Mm -hmm. Number three, very quickly, all things future. The future. That goes to leader development. That goes to, to where do we move force structure over time to get in front of demographic shifts in America so that we aren't recruiting or trying to retain soldiers in places where they, people just don't live anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the unique, one of the unique differences between the Army Reserve and the active component is we recruit and we retain soldiers where they live and where they work. We don't have the ability to just pick up the phone, tell somebody, hey, I need 100 more people over here and move them, a permit change of station order to some other location. That's not how it works. So I have to get the organization to think in front of move of demographics so that the force structure that we need to have in place is there to catch talent when it shows up. Or at least, at the very least, move it to where we know the talent is and is going to stay. Um, which takes us back to 1908. Big part of the future is, and this is a this is a role where the uh, America's Army Reserve plays a brings a key capability to the Army and to the Department of Defense. In my opinion, we have soldiers right now working, and I'm not going to list a bunch of corporations because I don't want to be. I'll leave somebody out, and I'll get in trouble. But <laughs> but we have soldiers right now who are in their civilian jobs working in very critical positions at a very very high rate of uh, at level of competency in emerging digital technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, s space flight, um, digital optics. Uh, high, high, extraordinarily high processing systems in terms of speed. Um, you're talking to an English major from the University of Virginia, so I don't want to get over my ski tips here too much about <laughs> all this cool stuff that's going on out there. But what I do know, and I actually have gotten a little bit more fluent on this than I was when I started, what I do know is uh, the Army Reserve has, I'll just call them sensors. We have, we have soldiers out there working in these fields, whether it's cyber, artificial intelligence, whatever, who are, who are essentially able to bring that knowledge and that, and that potential capability into the Army through the Army Reserve. Or, in some cases, this is, this is talent that was trained by the Army, but once, it's, once the soldiers finish their statutory service obligation to the Army, may make three times as much money doing this in the private sector, but still wants to remain affiliated with the Army so they can as I said, just sort of like the docs in 1908, surged to meet a requirement in the event of a national crisis. 
So again, the Army Reserve becomes the place where this talent goes and stays to remain a part of the team, but at the same time not be at a financial disadvantage because they're, because of their talent, they're able to command significantly more in the way of salary outside of the Army than inside the Army. So the future is a big part of how I look at my responsibilities uh, to the Army and to the American people. Mm, that's great. So, you know, General, uh, as we close today, I, I want to get your advice. Um, what advice would you think about uh, – what advice would you give someone who's thinking about a career in public service? When you say public service um, – there's so many aspects to that, you know. I'm, you know, the, I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big proponent of education as one of the strategic enablers for for just civil discourse and governance in America. Um, you know, maybe it's because I went to the University of Virginia. You know, and I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, a, I'm I sort of embrace Jefferson in regard that the, one of the one of the basic tenets of us governing ourselves is to be witting of what the challenges are, what the what the trade offs are, and 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 and, and compromise is, is appropriate and necessary to, to advance the common good. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there's a tremendous opportunity there. And I think there's a tremendous need for it there. What I'm uh, what I what I remain focused on, and I do talk to soldiers about this, we gotta make sure that we are constantly um, modeling, um, leading not not in terms of political discussion, not in terms of any particular view on any particular subject, but just in terms of basic professionalism, um, modeling what you know right looks like in terms of character in America. Um, I, I I just think that's a a, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and as the leader of America's Army Reserve, I feel very much it's a part of my responsibility to the Army um, and to my team to make sure that we're out there messaging to the American people, this is the coolest tribe, this is the coolest tribe in Western civilization. And I want people to want to be a part of this team because it's a great way for them to give back. It's a great way to put others before self. And it's also just a, a great team to hang out with. And so... To me, it's all about public service. Well, General, thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to come on in and talk to us today. But more importantly, Townley and I would like to thank you for your dedicated service to the country. Very much so. Thank you. Well, I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to, 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 to speak with both of you. And uh, I'll just say um, it's, it's been the honor of, of, of my life to lead uh, the coolest team in America. And we'll just keep pounding. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Business of Government Hour TV. Be sure to join us next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government effectiveness. Until next time, it's businessofgovernment.org.